barbara made the good point that is the mic on? yes. barbara made the good point. you made a big effort to be here on time on such a lovely day. and so we're going to start exactly well, almost exactly on time. ah today is geodynamics mixing ah geodynamics lecture number three on the topic of mixing i'm michael mango from the university of california berkeley and the word mixing refers to the set of processes that change the distribution of composition and structure and the distribution in both space and in time to illustrate the nature of the question that i'd like to answer and help you understand today let's begin by looking at this photograph this pair of photographs these are two photographs taken of a laboratory experiment done by julio otino and uh, his graduate students and so what are we looking at uh, this is a tank of fluid uh, colored blue and inside this box of fluid he immerses two drops of otherwise identical fluid that are colored green on the left red on the right so they have the same viscosity and the same density and then what he does to this box is he takes uh, the top boundary i guess you're looking from the top down you take the top boundary and you move it from the left to the right and you move it a prescribed distance and then you stop moving that top boundary and then you move the bottom boundary and you move the bottom boundary exactly the same distance from the right to the left and then you repeat this process so then you move the top boundary and then the bottom boundary and you do this repeatedly and on the bottom is what you see after a certain number of these cycles of moving the top and bo bottom boundary okay so there are two things to notice first what happened to the green blob yeah, rich says it looks like a swan okay <laughs> how about the red one it's smeared out it's kind of all over the place is this surprising or unexpected Ah, uh, okay so atom mass is everything the same we're moving the top boundary a certain distance to the right bottom boundary certain different distance to the left so exactly the same amount uh, these are placed roughly symmetrically above about the center line I mean it's a real experiment right on a computer you can put them exactly about the cent the same distance from the center line so I asked you a question and in fact there's no way you should be able to answer that question because I didn't give you even close to enough information to think about it and why not right remember when John Arnaud gave his lecture he talked about and he took you through systematically all the terms in the Navier-Stokes equations and what each each of them do right and hopefully you remember that as he added each one of these terms you saw qualitatively and quantitatively different types of flows different types of dynamics and so I don't think actually you can answer the question is that surprising or expected without actually knowing uh, what the governing equations are or what the relevant dynamics are so let me tell you what's going on and I will remind you of the Navier-Stokes equations that uh, John Arnaud took you through on Wednesday and I guess you saw a couple other times right so I've rewritten them for you earlier this morning on the left hand side we have the uh, terms associated with the acceleration of the fluid right or sometimes we call these inertial forces and those are going to be balanced by whatever pressure gradients exist and viscous stresses associated with the viscosity of the fluid okay so there's the most important number to describe this equation again is the dimensionless number we call the Reynolds number it's the ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces and I wrote down the order of magnitude of each of those terms and if you compare the ratio it looks like density times velocity times the length over <coughs> viscosity and it turns out for this particular experiment right velocities are small viscosities are quite large and this number then is much less than one in this experiment and this will in fact be the case for almost everything we look at today except for the second last slide where I will tell you what happens when this side becomes really big and the right hand side becomes small okay so in this limit then uh, equate or flow is governed by a set of equations called Stokes equations and this set of equations Stokes equations plus the conservation of mass equation on the far right of the board has an interesting and important property for everything many of the things we'll be seeing today this equation is linear right and the fact that this equation is linear will give rise to certain types of behaviors that we were we are going to exploit and try and use in fact to interpret some of what we see uh, 
right? What makes flows when Reynolds numbers are not small complicated is in fact this term on the left-hand side, velocities acting on velocity gradients. And this is what got, gives rise to turbulence and complexity. So the thing to keep in mind then uh, is that we're solving, we're looking at solutions of this equation obtained experimentally. So some of you this morning, I think, probably had some coffee, right? And in your coffee cup, you may have put some cream, right? And you might move your spoon across it. And what happens then? Your milk mixes pretty nicely into the coffee, right? But spoon, there's still swirling motions and so uh, there we go, uh, cause that mixing. In contrast, right, in this case, once you stop moving the boundaries, the fluid stops moving. Okay. So this is what we're going to try and understand for most of today's lecture, right, is how is it that mixing occurs. And I'll begin with a quotation from a review paper that virtually everyone agrees that mixing is complicated. And our objective is to try and make sense of some of this complexity and understand how mixing occurs. Very briefly, however, why are we studying mixing? If it's not so obvious, uh, the topic and word mixing has appeared in several different contexts and lectures so far. The idea, though, is to provide a quantitative framework to interpret the types of geochemical and isotopic measurements we can make in magmas that are erupted at the surface, or to interpret the kinds of structures we might image inside the Earth in terms of, in both cases, dynamics going on inside the Earth at, at the present or in the past. And I guess today we'll be, if we ever look at pictures of, the, of real problems, we'll be thinking about the mantle, Exactly the same processes and dynamics describe magmas, for example, or other systems. Okay. In the end, though, I guess the point of trying to understand mixing, in a way, is also to get better insights into how convection works and some of the consequences of convection. Let me also point out, like everyone else who's talked so far, right, um, ask questions anytime you have a question. Uh, in particular, for what we'll be looking at today, if you don't know boundary conditions or initial conditions or fluid properties, I think nothing will make sense, right? So if I forget to tell you, just go ahead and ask. Sana? Uh, you know, I didn't tell you where this figure comes from, but I made it when I was writing up my dissertation in uh, 20 years ago and two months. <laughs> right? And so the tool I use to make this is something called Island Draw. And I put this picture here mostly to remind myself that our pictures of the Earth aren't dramatically different 20 years later. Maybe they are, but... You know, there's a core mantle boundary and there's a surface and slabs and plumes. <laughs> okay. right. But one of our objectives would be ultimately, of course, to put qu quantitatively interpret the kinds of measurements we can make at the surface. And I'll show you very briefly two examples. So I define mixing as the set of processes that affect the distribution of composition and structure in space and in time. So I'll show you one example of variations in space, another for variations in time. This is a a somewhat older compilation of hel the ratios of helium-3 to helium-4 measured in uh, basalts erupted on the seafloor, uh, mid-ocean ridge basalts in orange, ocean island basalts in blue. Without even thinking about what these numbers mean and how they arise, I think you notice two things, right? First, uh, the composition of this ratio in morbs is, uniform, is roughly the same. There's a great variability in ocean island basalts. This means that within the Earth, there must be some areas that are reasonably homogeneous and other areas that are not homogeneous, right? And they're sampled in different ways. So examples for variations in time. Uh, I really like this paper when it, when it came out because it's, it's kind of cool. It doesn't, there are more recent updated versions. I suspect Rich may be showing you this in the next presentation. Uh, so we're not going to worry too much about what's going on in some of the complexities, but I will explain what you're looking at briefly. Uh, what's plotted on the vertical axis is the concentration of two different uh, siderophile elements, platinum on the top, ruthenium on the bottom, horizontal axis in age going from 3.6 billion years ago on the right to 2.6 billion years ago on the left. The inset shows a longer time period uh, with an expanded scale. And these are measurements made on uh, chromatiite, so high temperature melts. And because they're high temperature melts, large melt fractions, they should be among the better um, measurements of what the mantle's composition should be. And so we've talked about these siderophile elements, how they like to go into the core. Their, uh, their abundance in the Earth's mantle is roughly chondritic. And one of your tutorials, in fact, the first geochemistry one, was to try and understand what might govern these concentrations. 
So here's the variation in time component, is that we do see secular changes in their abundance in these erupted magmas up to a certain point. So the interpretation of this particular paper was that this is material that was delivered after the core formed, after the moon formed, and was progressively mixed into the mantle. Over what time scales this material mixed into the mantle and then resampled? So we're going to try and get a time scale out of this data, assuming this hypothesis is correct, that stuff is added to the surface of the Earth, gets into the mantle and resampled by volcanism. Yeah, about a billion years. So I think what's equally interesting, though, is that there's actually a second time scale in this data if this is the correct interpretation. Right, what else do you notice about these measurements? Admittedly, there's not very many of them. There's a gap. Yeah, there's a gap. People need to go find rocks of that age. <laughs> Sorry? There's a lot of scatter, but there's, in fact, I think what's more striking is that there's not that much scatter, right? So, <laughs> and I don't mean that in a negative way. Let's go back to this picture where we started, right? If we were to sample the Earth, right, this is our Earth, and maybe we can pretend the red stuff is this material mixed into the mantle, and we're to randomly sample it. In this case, we might get blue or we might get red, right? So this could be low, this could be very high. In order to see something that varies smoothly over time, it also means that you're mixing that material in on very short time scales so that you see a nice secular trend in concentration. So if this is material gradually being mixed into the mantle from a proto-crust or from, from the surface, there are two time scales you see here. The time scale to add it to the mantle, that's about a billion years, and a time scale to homogenize it in the mantle, which must be short, on the order of 100 million years. In fact, it was interpretation of the data that was the subject of one of the uh, group projects uh, two years ago here at CIDR. Okay, so here's what I'd like to cover today. Uh, we'll begin with a little bit of terminology. And again, if I use words or terminology that make no sense or you want some clarification, please ask. We'll then spend most of our time trying to understand the physics of how mixing occurs. Very briefly, ways in which we can characterize mixing, that is how we measure uh, properties of mixing. And a little bit about mixing into the mantle. The objective here is not to give you a review of state of the art of mixing. Uh, they're good examples on the posters. Uh, Alan McNamara showed some of Ming Ming Li's uh, results from, that were published this year in his lecture. And Liz is not here to ask those tough questions, right? But she asked the question earlier when we talked about the approximations that go into mantle convection. What are the consequences of those assumptions? And so as we go through each of these different topics, Hopefully, I'll remember to answer this question. And if I don't, uh, just ask. OK, uh, right. I was going to tell you what I'm not gonna, going to talk about, because some of these are really important topics, right? So we don't need to worry about how convection works. We've covered that elsewhere. I will not talk about uh, the geochemistry we, we would like to interpret. An important topic, and an interesting one, is this third one. How do we go about, in a numerical simulation, keeping track of mixing and doing the calculations? There are subtleties and complexities here that are interesting and important to think about if you'd like to interpret the results of numerical simulations. Uh, I will not talk about turbulent mixing. This is what occurs in the core, the oceans, and the atmosphere, except very briefly. For the early Earth, uh, there's a lot of mixing that arises because of big impacts. And this is something that's interesting that we will not talk about. Okay. And so I'm going to give you a summary of what we're going to try and learn. And then if, if you want to fall asleep, I suppose you can. But first, the type of flow uh, matters for mixing. Time dependence enhances mixing. The properties of the structures being mixed also matter. And finally, we'll be talking about how convection uh, removes heterogeneity, destroys heterogeneity. It is, of course, convection that also produces heterogeneity and structure inside the Earth as well. OK, so how does mixing occur? There are four different components to mixing. So we have, well, actually three components, right? We have a yellow box of fluid here into which we immerse a green blob. And then we're going to have some kind of flow happening. So the first stage is we're going to take this green blob and stretch it out to make this long filament. And the box has a finite size, and so the filament ultimately has to get folded upon itself. So two important processes, stretching and folding. Uh, 
right in the top here, the green is separate from the yellow, but over time, molecular diffusion or some other diffusive process may cause the yellow and the green to mix. And in the cases where we have interfacial tension between the green and the yellow here, surface tension may be, interfacial tension may become important and cause these filaments to break up into little droplets. Right? And so this may occur, we won't talk about it in the context of the mantle, but if you've got metal sulfides in a silicate melt or uh, any other metal inside a silicate melt, this pro will, process will happen and the size, distribution, and properties of these droplets are controlled, in fact, by the flow as well. Okay, some definitions then. Uh, we use the word stirring to refer to that, those two processes, the stretching and folding of material. And the consequence of the stretching and folding is length scales become smaller, right? If we go back to that picture, our shortest length scale was the diameter here now. Length scales are becoming shorter. When we use the word mixing, we're referring to the combination of both stirring and diffusion. So I've been kind of sloppy so far. I've used mixing generically. And I'm going to continue being sloppy and just call mixing uh, the sum everything. And we'll see why, in fact, that within the mantle, at least, diffusion will not be important. And we will quantify that. OK. Two other terms I will be using. When we talk about something I'll call a passive tracer, this is something that moves with whatever the flow is doing. U is the velocity, X is position, T is time. And this tracer doesn't influence the flow itself. Okay. And this is to distinct from what we'll call, I guess the opposite of passive is active, right? You're all very passive and you're going to become more active. Active heterogeneities influence the flow because they have differences in density and differences in viscosity or other rheological properties. So they will also be deformed by the flow uh, they will stretch, they may mix, but they'll influence the flow itself. Okay. So I gave you a list of the, kind, the main points I'd like to make. We will start with the first, that flow type matters. So let's first think about how we can characterize the stretching of a material. And we'll imagine we've got some flow, right, velocity u, and we will put a little filament of material into that flow. The filament has a length capital D capital X, and it'll be stretched by some flow to some new length, d small x. And this uh, function f, this tensor f, simply describes in some way that I did not write down what the, that velocity field is, right? The velocity takes the filament and stretches it to a new length. And so we will characterize then how much stretching occurs by simply dividing the final length, right? The vertical lines mean magnitude, the final length by the initial length. So what's going to change the length of a filament, right? You imagine you've got a filament. To change its length, what does the velocity field have to look like around that filament? If it's uniform, will the length change, right? A uniform flow in the same direction as the filament. It's not going to change, right? You need a velocity at one end that's different from the other end. If there's a velocity difference, you have a velocity gradient, right? So the stretching of that filament, its length lambda, is going to depend on velocity gradients, right? And the bigger the velocity gradients, the more it's going to stretch. So in order to characterize stretching, what we're going to do is sit on that filament and move with it, and over time measure how its length changes. And so capital D here is a material derivative. It's a the time derivative in a frame of reference moving with that filament. And you can show, and I will not show this to you, that it scales, it's proportional to velocity gradients, right? Here's our velocity gradient. But it depends on the orientation of the filament. Uh, as well. This quantity E you've seen a couple times before, right? It's called the uh, uh, rate of strain tensor. And why does it, the orientation of the filament matter, right? Velo velocity has a direction, gradients have a direction, right? And filaments have a direction. And so all these directions interact with each other. This might be complicated to think about if you're not used to thinking about tensors. So what I'm going to do next is simplify this problem to uh, three idealized cases. And in fact, these three idealized cases may be the most important thing I show you today because these will be the building blocks for thinking about any mixing problem. Okay. So what we're going to do is think about the simplest possible flows in a two-dimensional world, right? We'll, have, we'll let X be horizontal coordinate. Y will be the vertical coordinate. And we'll consider linear flows. What does linear mean? Velocity simply varies linearly with respect to position. So VX will be the velocity in the horizontal direction. And we'll let it vary linearly with respect to the vertical direction. 
and G is the constant of proportionality. What are the units of G? Yeah, one over time, right? It's a strain rate, right? So G is the strain rate. Okay, and then we'll let the velocity that's going in the vertical direction be a linear function of the position times the same strain rate, and we'll multi multiply it by a constant K. Right? Okay, so I've written down this linear velocity field. What does it actually look like for special cases? Let's consider the case where we make K equal to minus one. Okay. So the lower pan set of panels here illustrates uh, two things, what, the, what things called streamlines look like and what the velocity field looks like. I don't think we have yet defined this thing called a streamline. A streamline is a snapshot of what the velocity, the direction of the velocity uh, would be at that particular instant in time, right? So in this case, where k equals minus, and then the velocity, I think you can interpret the picture in the lower left, right? The arrows indicate the direction of flow and the magnitude of flow, right? So at the top, we're going faster this way. At the bottom, we're going this way. In the, on the horizontal plane, we're moving in the vertical direction. And this leads to a rotating motion about the origin, right? And so these streamlines are simply tracking. If you were to actually follow the fluid, you'd move around that circle. Okay, in that case, k equals minus one, we have rotation. Do we get any stretching? We get no stretching, right? We put our little pencil here and it rotates around the origin, but it's not getting any longer. What is it doing though? It is changing direction, right? It's changing its orientation. Okay. So keep that in mind, right? This, these flows that involve rotation, there's no stretching, but there is at least a change in orientation. Let's look at the other case. We'll let k equal one. When k equals one, right, basically the flow is coming into the origin along this dashed line, right, and moving away from the origin uh, along the other dashed line. In some of your classes, you may have called these pure shear flows or extensional flows or hyperbolic flows. Important feature for what we'll see next is as you get further away from the origin, right, velocity increases. It increases linearly. Okay. So we have a change of position with respect to time, right, that's what a velocity is, proportional to distance. If you integrate that equation, what happens to distance? D length dt proportional to length. At least geochemists know how to integrate that equation, right? Things increase exponentially in time. So whereas in the case k equals minus one, right, we're not changing length. In this case, if we put some filament in here, it's going to get longer and longer. And as you get further from the origin, velocity is going up, right? And so its length will increase exponentially in time. And I wrote that here for you, right? The length increases exponentially in time at a rate proportional to the shear rate. Okay. So let's finally think about the case in the middle that's sometimes called simple shear, right? All the flow is now in the horizontal direction and the speed increases as you move away from the center line, right? Okay, this case too, we can also look at how the length of our filament changes. I'll put my filament right here, right? And it's going to rotate a little bit and this top part will keep moving to the right, right? The velocity is constant. So if you integrate a constant with respect to time, you find that it increases linearly in time. So for the case in the middle, k equals zero or simple shear flow, length increases linearly with respect to time. Okay, which of these flows is obviously the most, the best at mixing? <laughs> Oops, I, I wasn't supposed to show you the answer, right? <laughs> obviously anything that increases exponentially is way better than things that increase linearly. Right? I think this is why you're told to invest money for your retirement when you're young. So, right? Things increase exponentially in time. Uh, what's the sum of minus one and one? It's zero, right? But this is important. The fact that our flow, our governing equations are linear means that this picture in the middle, right, can be e written as the sum of the one on the left and then the one on the right. And this will become important later, actually. So our simple shear flow that gives rise to linear mixing involves a combination of rotation, right, which changes orientation, and the one on the right that causes exponential stretching, right? So the point here is that this type of flow is by far the best at stretching, right, in giving rise to mixing because it's exponential. Uh, and in the end, any flow we look at, we can decompose it into these different components and add them up and think about what each part is doing.
So let's think now how we can take these different components and think about a flow, and we'll consider we're going to get progressively more complicated. We'll think about the simplest case. Again, I'll refer you to a picture of a laboratory experiment. We have a box of fluid. We're looking at it from the top down. Boundary on the left is moving up. Boundary on the right is moving down. Picture on the right with those lines shows those things called streamlines, right? This is a steady flow, meaning nothing is changing in time. So if you were to sit on one of these lines, you'd simply follow it around that loop. Okay. So what we're going to do now, and at least in the picture in the bottom, they, uh, Otino and his students put a horizontal line of red fluid, and you can see that fluid wrap around itself. So what are we doing? We're stretching it, right? We're stirring it. Is this an efficient or effective means of stretching and stirring a fluid? Certainly on the, the picture in the bottom right, we've, we've stirred it around, we've made that filament go all over the place. But it turns out steady flows are not very good at mixing, and why is that? If it's steady, right, and you put your red dye on, on this streamline right here, what is it going to do? It'll simply follow that streamline indefinitely, right? It has absolutely no way of going from one place to another. Right? So in order for the material you put here to get to the other side, right, you need some aspect that's going to change with respect to time, uh, in order to get to that position. Okay. But again, in this picture, right, we do see those two building blocks for flows uh, right here in the middle, right, about which, thing about which the fluid is rotating. Right? We have that k equals minus 1, or rotating type flow. In the middle here, we have fluid coming in, and we have fluid going out. Right? That was the flow pictured here, the extensional flow or the hyperbolic flow. So one way we can think about the stretching that it does occur in the steady flow is that we have a point about which things rotate. These are going to be referred to as elliptic points. And then we have a point where fluid comes in and moves out. This is where stretching happens, and this is going to be called a hyperbolic point. Okay. Okay, any questions yet? Yeah, Anat? So, um, I guess I've never thought about this. So the difference between mixing and homogenizing are actually vast, right? Because here you're mixing it into this other material, but they're not homogenizing. Yes, so okay. So I was, I've been sloppy, right? Actually, well, sub mixing has two parts. There's the stirring and stretching, and then the diffusion. So at what length scale does the diffusion then become important? Uh, diffusion will become important based on the diffusivity and the time you wait, it'll scale like a, a diffusivity. Uh, length, length in diffusive processes goes like uh, diffusivity divided by times time to the one half. And, and I'm going to quantify that later on for you. And when you said the diffusion wasn't important in the mantle. Yes. So does that mean that the mantle does not homogenize? What I, you, there's a question what we mean by homogenous, in fact, that depends on the scale at which you sample something. So if I were to go into this box and always pull out fluid in a volume this big and measure its average properties because I'm in the sampling process, I'm mixing it up, it, things may look homogenous at the scale you look at it, whereas in the volume that you've sampled, they may not be hom homogenous. And later on, depending on how, how things go, I'll address that qu question as well. Bill? Just, uh, I just want to make a quick comment that that reminded me of uh, in a sense, mid-ocean ridge basalts, because while we, as your slide shows, we can think of a single reservoir, in detail we can see differences between the three ocean basins. Right. Yes, that's right. T uh, maybe I'll show a picture later to address that. Louise, I'll, I can repeat the question too. If, uh, uh, is it reversible? Is this flow reversible? The uh, question is, is this reversible? If you yes. stop this okay. and turn it the other direction. So one of the coolest features of Stokes equations or linear equations in general is they have a property that's often called reversibility. That if I were to reverse the direction of these arrows, right, what should happen to the fluid? It should do exactly the opposite, right? The velocity should, should simply change direction. And so if you were to re reverse the direction of these arrows, this thing would unwind itself back to the straight line. And I have some videos done by, uh, that I'll show you later to illustrate this because it's just cool. <laughs> okay. So let's go to the time-dependent problem. The point is steady flows are not good for mixing. You add time dependence, and of course, mixing will be more effective. 
So here's the setup for the experiment I showed you on the very first slide. We'll move our top boundary left to right, bottom boundary right to left. And there's really only one number that characterizes, one dimensionless number that characterizes this problem, right? Uh, and that is how far the boundary moves, right? That's a distance, right? Speed times time. And to make it dimensionless, we divide it by the, uh, the vertical dimension of the box. And that is the only parameter that should govern the flow inside this box. How long the boundary moves compared, the distance the boundary moves compared to the size of the box. Okay. And that number is going to be called D, and we'll look at results for different values of D. So again, here's the experiments you saw on that first slide, just a few other snapshots. We started off with a yellow blob, right, and a red blob to start. And after one cycle of this motion, top boundary moving, bottom boundary moving, the yellow dot is exactly where it started. And what happened to the red one? Stretched a little bit, right? Okay, so now we're going to go through multiple of these cycles, top boundary moving, bottom boundary moving. After three periods, we get to the picture in the upper right. Yellow blob is largely intact, more or less close to where it started. Okay, right. So notice these are integer numbers, one, three. And if you were to do this at five or two or so on, in fact, the yellow blob would always end up exactly where it started. Okay, and we'll try and understand this later. We'll now look at non-integer periods, right? So we'll take a snapshot. And where's the yellow blob in this picture? It's kind of hidden right up there, right? Okay. And again, another, you wait longer, of course, the red stuff is being stirred ever more. Uh, and it's a non-integer period, and the yellow blob is over here on the right. Okay. So first point, though, written at the top is that in this flow, right, clearly we have some areas that are being mixed very, our stirring is very efficient. Right? That's where the red fluid is sampling. But there are other areas inside this flow that are obviously not good at mixing because this yellow blob is staying largely intact. Okay. And I have not explained how this happens or why it happens. That's what we'll do next. Kanani? You, you may have said this before, but what is this fluid? Uh, I think it's a silicon oil. But it's a Newtonian fluid. Uh, it's got a reasonably high viscosity to, to make sure that inertial forces don't matter. Yeah, June. So are these all taken in a row, or are these multiple simulations sampled at different time steps? Yeah, so this is a single experiment, and you can think okay. about this as sets of snapshots okay. at four different so times. Okay, so that's the case, then how do we conserve the greenness from the third panel to the fourth panel? Is it truly just two-dimensional, or is this an artifact of...? Yeah, so I think, you know, this is a real experiment. And uh, one thing you'll notice, it looks like the red area is kind of expanding. So I suspect that there's sort of uh, lighting effects or something else where things look wider than they truly are. Because if it's a truly two-dimensional flow, the cross-sectional area that's either red or green should stay the same. Okay, so the challenge here to understand what's happening is that this is a time-dependent problem, right? So we have snapshots of what the flow looks like at any instant in time. And we'd like to be able to think about this, right? But we have too many dimensions. We have two spatial dimensions that we can see plus that time dimension. So what do you want to do when you have things varying in time and space? I guess now you could watch a movie, right? <laughs> but <laughs> there's more insight to be gained, in fact, about the process by doing something else first. Right. And what we're going to do is we want to get rid of one dimension so we can go back to looking at things in two dimensions, right? And we're going to do this by taking advantage of something called a Poincaré section. We're essentially going to map the time dependence back into space. And I'll try and illustrate this. Hopefully you'll get the general idea because it'll make these pictures easier to understand that I'll be showing you next, right? So we have some flow. These, red these yellow lines indicate the trajectory that an imaginary particle is taking through that flow. Uh, and we'll c let's consider this first one here that says periodic. Okay. So the particle starts here, moves through the fluid, and comes back exactly where it started. And this is something we will refer to as something moving on a periodic orbit. Always comes back to where it is. We may have another particle that starts over here, moves around, and after that same amount of time, it's no longer where it started. It's somewhere else. Okay. And so what we're going to do is essentially map everything onto uh, what things look like every one of these periods and see where particles moving through the fluid end up. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to that experiment I just showed you and think about why we saw those two different types of mixings, then I'll try and generalize. 
So picture on the top again is our box, uh, right? Boundaries move at the top and the bottom. And we will place our, start it, we'll start with a piece of fluid or a trace, pa passive tracer right here where the red dot is located. And we will let the bottom boundary move first, I guess, in this case. And it will follow, uh, we'll let the top boundary move left to right. right. This upper closed loop is a streamline for the case where the top boundary is moving that passes through the point. And so during one of these uh, cycles, the point here over on the right follows the bl solid black line and ends up at the place labeled P. Now we're going to move the bottom boundary. And the bigger loop shows the streamline passing through that point when the bottom boundary is moving. And so during the next cycle, the fluid will move from point P exactly back to where it started. Right? So it will follow. A, it's an example of a periodic uh, point in that you always end up back where you started after one period. Okay. Now remember when we looked at a steady flow, right? We, we talked about these things called elliptic points and hyperbolic points. Elliptic points were ones about which you rotated. Hyperbolic points were places where you came in and you went out, right? And it was at hyperbolic points you get stretching to cause mixing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to project everything by taking pictures every one period of the cycle and see where things end up. But we will see analogous uh, points in our flow to the elliptic and hyperbolic points you saw before, except what we'll be looking at is if we put two points nearby each other, do they stay close to each other and rotate around this point, or do they diverge from each other? Do they get further away? Okay. And so we will use these terms elliptic and hyperbolic point in an analogous form, but keep in mind we've projected time onto this two-dimensional world. Okay, and in this particular box we had an elliptic point. These are called periodic points. You always come back to where you started. And then there are a bunch of hyperbolic points. Okay, where do we put the green dot? We put the green dot right here at the elliptic point, right? So it always goes through the same periodic orbit, ends up back where it started. These other hyperbolic points, flow will come into that vicinity, be stretched exponentially, and end up getting distributed through the box. Okay. So here's what these things called Poincaré sections look at. You basically put tracers in there, right? And then take a snapshot of where they are every one period. Okay. So the case we've been looking at, uh, all these graphics look like they're being washed out, so it's a bit hard to see. Uh, we put the red, gr green blob in here, in this white circle, right, where there's an elliptic point, and basically fluid always ends up back there, back where it started. The hyperbolic points were distributed out here. When fluid comes close to them, it gets stretched and uh, goes away. So what I have found remarkable about this set of experiments, right, this is a super simple flow, right? It's just a box and you're moving the boundaries in a, smooth, in a straight line. The nature of the mixing the, or the stretching and the stirring is very complicated, right? So the example you saw here was this one, not well mixed, well mixed. If you only move the top boundary three times its depth, right, you get super complicated patterns. Lots of areas that don't mix well, other areas that mix. Now you go up to a large displacement, everything mixes, right? And then you go a little bit further and you get areas that don't mix again popping up. So. Yes. So what controls the location of the points um, in this scenario, and why is it asymmetric? Uh, so it should be symmetric about the midpoint in the tank, right, a along a line going through the middle. And that's because the, f the flow is symmetric about the midpoint. But why is it not symmetric about the midpoint this way? There is a, a way you start, right? You start always moving one boundary and then the other. So there's not symmetry about the midplane in the vertical direction. So what controls where these are? It's clearly very complicated, right? In fact, these flows have a feature that are called chaotic. And the word chaotic, chaotic flows have extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. And so I don't know if there's any way to intuitively predict what these patterns look like, which is what made this an interesting subject of research a couple decades ago, <laughs> is understanding these flows. Okay. So the first point that I want to make today was that um, uh, stirring is produced by, stirring can produce complicated structures, but at the same time leave large areas that are not well mixed. What we'd like to do, of course, is understand under what circumstances this mixing happens efficiently. And this is a characteristic of features called chaotic flows that I'll define next. 
But what I thought I'd do, because we're halfway through our time, is instead take a break and show you a movie. <laughs> right. uh, on Wednesday, John Arnaud talked about something called the Taylor-Proudman theorem, or, t uh, or Taylor-Proudman constraint. And that's named after G.I. Taylor. G.I. Taylor is a famous um, fluid mechanics person or applied mathematician from Cambridge. And you'll see lots of names, something Taylor. And a good fraction of those are G.I. Taylor. And he made a set of uh, educational or pedagogic movies, uh, I guess in the 50s maybe, uh, to into, the early 60s. In, into the early 60s. And these are beautiful movies because he explains by doing very simple experiments the different types of things that uh, uh, arise in, fl in flows. So John Arnaud showed you an example for rotating flows, and G.I. Taylor did something analogous for low Reynolds number flows and turbulent flows. And for low Reynolds number flows, there's a set of two movies. Why can't I get this to work? And I'm not going to show you all 30 minutes of them, although it may be more entertaining. What I will show you, though, is the main feature of this flow that we talked about earlier that Louise asked about uh, called reversibility. Low Reynolds number flows are reversible when the direction of motion of the boundaries which gave rise to the flow is reversed. This may lead to some surprising situations which might almost make one believe that the fluid has a memory of its own. Here are two concentric cylinders. The fluid can be moved by turning the inner cylinder with this handle. The annulus between them is filled with glycerine. Into this space I introduce some dye which stays put owing to the high viscosity of the glycerine. Note its position before I start turning it. I now turn it four times, pushing the handle clockwise. The dye seems to mix as a drop of milk mixes when it is stirred into a cup of tea. Now I reverse the direction. And after turning exactly four turns, the dyed area reappears in its original position with a little fuzziness due to molecular diffusion. To see what happens, we have a second apparatus that is filled with syrup. It has a wider gap and we can look down on it. A little colored syrup is injected to mark the fluid. When the cylinder is turned, this fluid is stretched round the annulus. Now the inner cylinder is turned back exactly to its starting position. During the forward motion, the boundary of the fluid follows a path determined at each instant by the motion of the wall. At these very low Reynolds numbers, particles within the fluid move when the boundary moves and they stop when it stops. During the reversed motion, the boundary of the fluid position. The motion of a rigid body is also reversible. Here is one with a gap to mark its orientation. I think you get the idea, though, right? <laughs> okay, so the, the feature that gives rise to good mixing at these low Reynolds numbers, right, 
we talked about how time dependence can enhance this. In general, what gives rise to good mixing will be flows that are chaotic. And so here's a definition of what we mean by chaotic flows. Chaotic flows have the feature that they can both stretch fluids, and we'll see next that they, uh, you need to fold them. The trajectories are very sensitive to initial conditions. And I think you understand now why, right? People tell you chaotic flows are very sensitive to initial conditions. If you put two points very close to a hyperbolic point, what happens to their relative position? They separate exponentially with respect to time, right? So it is the hyperbolic points that exist in these flows that give rise to the sensitivity to initial conditions. This is math. I'm going to skip this. Uh, another way of thinking about these flows is they produce things that are often known as horseshoe maps. So I'm going to take you through each of those features in a little bit more detail. So how do we go about characterizing mixing again? We defined the magnitude of stretching, right, by that term lambda from before. It was the ratio of the final length to the initial length. One way to think about whether a flow is going to be efficient or not is to think about how quickly lambda is increasing, how, much, how fast lengths are increasing, compared to the magnitude of the velocity gradients in the flow that produce those mi that mixing. Right? The magnitude of velocity gradients was proportional to the rate of strain tensor E. Right? So if you take this double dot product of the rate of strain tensor, you can think of it as a measure of the magnitude of velocity gradients. You've actually seen that quantity before. It was the it was proportional to the viscous dissipation inside uh, a fluid. The vertical axis tells you how rapidly lengths increase with respect to time. Okay. And this is going to be, turns out mathematically, some number that's between 0 and 1. And one physical interpretation of this measure of efficiency is given that the denominator is a measure of dissipation by the flow. It's actually a measure of how much, of, how much energy is dissipated through stretching compared to that within the flow. Okay, so we've seen how lengths lambda increase with respect to time in different types of flows, right? For our simple shear flow, lengths increase linearly with respect to time, right? The derivative of log time, right, is 1 over time. And so our mixing efficiency decays like 1 over time as time goes on. It basically goes to zero. Linear uh, shear flows essentially cause no mixing after long times. On the other hand, uh, our hyperbolic flow, or that pure shear, that extensional flow, causes lengths to increase exponentially with respect to time. Right? So the mixing efficiency approach is a constant. So it's clear what it takes to have an efficient flow at stirring. Right? You want to have extensional flows. But there's a problem here. Right? In that extensional flow I showed you, velocities increase as you move away from the origin. Right? And in order to keep mixing efficiently, what do you have to keep doing then? You have to keep moving away from that origin, right? You're going to get infinitely far away in order to maintain that mixing. And the real world is not infinite in spatial dimensions, right? So in a real fluid, because you can't keep moving away from one of these hyperbolic points to keep that stretching efficiency high, you have to find some way to get back to that point and get stretched again. Okay. So this turns out to be why the building blocks for flows that are good at mixing have two components, right? You need those extensional flows, the hyperbolic point to stretch, but you need to get back there. And it's the rotation component of the flow or the reorientation that gives you the chance to go back to a hyperbolic point and get stretched again. Maybe that was un overly complicated, right? But the key to remember, again, there are two parts of flows, right? Rotation and stretching. Stretching is how you get good mixing. But to get back to a point that causes stretching, you need to reorient and get back there. Okay, so conceptually, another way of thinking about what causes good mixing are flows that produce things that qualitatively look like this thing called a horseshoe map. Right? We have stretching, and we can stretch. Right? We're making length scales thinner, which is what we would like to do. But since we can't keep doing that indefinitely, we need to take the material we stretched, bring it back to where we started. And we do that by folding it. Right? So the repeated process of folding and stretching is what gives rise to good mixing. In terms of what we saw, right, this involves having a rotation component to the flow as well as a hyperbolic point. OK, so that was the first point. Properties of the flow matter, right? Time dependence enhances mixing. Most of the stretching occurs near these hyperbolic points. And we need to find ways to get back to those hyperbolic points to keep getting mixing. Uh, this should have been number two. Second point was that the properties of the heterogeneity that's being mixed also matter. And what, these are, what we're going to look at now are things we refer to as active tracers, things with different densities or different viscosities. And again, we'll consider idealized problems. So we have a box up here on the left. 
Top boundary is going to move left to right. Free slip boundaries everywhere on the other sides. And so what's illustrated in the second panel is the nature of the flow for that particular problem. And now what we're going to do is immerse a blob of one fluid with different properties into that other fluid. And the only difference between these two fluids will be the viscosity. The viscosity of the blob is lambda times bigger than the surroundings. Okay. And so what's illustrated on the bottom are the trajectories of that blob for three cases. On the left, it's 10 times more viscous than the surroundings. In the middle, it's a passive tracer. Right? This is our reference, what things would look like if it was just a passive tracer. On the right, it's 10 times less viscous than the surroundings. What's the obvious difference? Yeah, you get when things are things are more viscous than the surroundings, right? They don't stretch very much, right? And as you increase the viscosity difference, if you make things more and more viscous, they deform less. If you make them less and less viscous, they deform more easily. Okay, we can quantify this a little bit more carefully. Now, remember, we said we thought about these different building blocks for flows, right? Rotation, not good. It doesn't change shape. We talked about uh, simple shear flows and extensional flows. So let's look at how our active heterogeneity here with the different viscosity stretches in those two flows. Uh, simple shear on the right, extensional flow on the left. What I'm plotting on the vertical axis in both cases is the length of our, of our blob compared to its initial radius as a function of time. Okay, each of the numbers you see up here are those viscosity ratios, so a thousand times more viscous than the surroundings, a thousand times less viscous than the surroundings. And time on the horizontal axis is divided by 1 plus the viscosity ratio. Okay. So it's, a, it's a, a scaling relationship that it, it was, was derived, intended to describe how rapidly things stretch given a certain flow compared to the viscosity ratio. And so in our extensional flow on the left, we do get exponential stretching. And this kind of scaling more or less captures the effects of the viscosity ratio. Okay. And I, I, I don't, I'm not going to explain where the scaling comes from. Okay, what's in, more interesting on the right, we have a linear, uh, a simple shear flow. And so we have linear stretching for our passive tracer viscosity ratio one and these low viscosity ratios. But what's happening when things are more, vi more viscous than the surroundings, say five or 10 times more viscous? They're stretching and then they're unstretching back to a sphere and then they stretch and they unstretch. Right, why is that happening? You probably don't remember these numbers I called K before, right? But we, we, I had a picture was, uh, let's see, rotating flows, simple shear flow, pure shear. And at the time I said simple shear is the sum of pure shear extension plus rotation, right? Our extension is causing the stretching, but there's also rotation in these flows, right? So we're stretching our blob and we're rotating it into an orientation where it can't get stretched again, right? And so these blobs in this case are always rotating. They're stretching and unstretching, stretching and unstretching because of the rotation component of the flow. So in, generally, in general, in complicated flows where you do have lots of, this, of simple shear, in fact, it's very difficult to stretch things that are much more viscous than the surroundings. This is a problem that G.I. Taylor first solved, actually. I guess in 1934, he wrote a paper on this problem. And the magic viscosity ratio to keep you from stretching is four. So I'm not going to explain the picture on the left. The point is that uh, because we have differences in viscosity, stretching is going to be influenced. And because we have uh, spatial variations in viscosity in the flow, the flow itself will be altered as well. Nick? I, I can repeat the question then. Okay. So in this case, absolutely everything is kept the same. Uh, time is also normalized by the shear rate. Uh, and density is uh, the same as the surroundings. So the only thing we're changing is the viscosity. And the idea here is to know quantitatively how does changing the viscosity affect the rate of stretching. Right? And so now we have a scaling relationship to tell us that. Maybe it's easier to see this in a movie. Right? So this time it's a convecting system, hot on the bottom, cold at the top. Whoops, if I use my pointer, the movie stops. Okay, and inside that box, 
there was a region that has a different, a region was identified with a different viscosity. Uh, and that's what's shown on the bottom is the viscosity, diff, uh, the re this region that was introduced. And because it has a large viscosity, right, it basically stays largely intact and circulates around the convection cell. So Nick asked about uh, other properties that may change in particular density, right? So there are two, two things we can change to our fluid here. We can change its density and, its, uh, and the viscosity difference. Once we start changing density, things can get very complicated. So I'm going to show you two examples. The first will be thermal plumes. We're also going to change, allow for the possibility that we're entraining something that has a different density. June? Can you go back to the previous slide? Can you explain which the two different projections as one from the top, one from the side? Yeah, so actually what we're looking at, this is, these are both, it's a two-dimensional numerical simulation of convection. Uh, we're looking from the side. On the left, we're looking at a temperature field. On the right, we're looking at composition. You can think about this as okay. composition one, composition zero. And associated with this difference in composition, there's a difference in viscosity. So in, inside the convecting flow on the left, you've just put a blob. Uh, so spatially, these represent the same box. It's exactly the same thing okay. at the same time. The movies are synchronized. Okay. okay, so these are the results of some laboratory experiments. Let me explain the setup to you and define the key parameter as well. So we have a box of fluid. We heat it from the bottom. You add thermal buoyancy to the bottom of the box. Uh, you create a boundary layer that becomes gravitationally unstable, rises to make a plume. And this outlined green line is an isothermal surface of constant temperature. Okay. okay, now there's a whole bunch of different pictures here shown for plumes with different conditions. What's changing? Uh, at the bottom of this tank, a thin layer of fluid was placed that's colored orange that has a difference in density from the surroundings. Okay, so we have two things that matter for these plumes. The thermal buoyancy provided by heating the bottom. And the magnitude of the thermal buoyancy is density coefficient of thermal expansion times a temperature difference, right? So this is, you can think of as thermal buoyancy. There's also a density difference between that brown fluid and the surroundings, characterized by delta C X E F F. Right. And so as we go, as we go from systematically from left to right, we're changing the density difference of the stuff at the bottom of the tank. We're making it ever heavier. Okay, so th pure thermal plume on the left, uh, and bottom over here shows a map projection of the density in the plume. When the dense layer is just a little bit more dense than the surroundings, it gets pulled up in the middle of the plume. Plume still stays nice and symmetric. We increase the density difference a bit more. You get a slightly more complicated shape. Uh, once it gets big enough, though, things, all kinds of crazy things happen, right? You're pulling up dense fluid, and then it's de more dense than the surroundings. As it cools a little bit, it sinks and flows back down. So point here is that if we change both viscosity and density, right, we can get more complicated uh, flow patterns. And one final example to look at consequences for mixing, I'll show you the results now of a numerical simulation done in three dimensions. Okay, so we have a box representing the mantle, plates moving right to left at six centimeters per year. We've got a lower mantle and upper mantle. Uh, I didn't have a chance to get an, a, a better looking simulation here. Uh, upper mantle is 10 times less viscous than the surroundings. And there's a dense layer at the bottom of the mantle. That parameter from the previous slide, if you're curious, is 0.1 in the simulation. Okay, so you can see a plume on the top rise and rise vertically. And it's a complicated, ugly structure, right? Not like nice thermal plumes normally look, at, look like. What's more important for the context of stretching and stirring here is this complicated flow and structure you see here also causes uh, more complicated stirring and mixing. So at the base of the simulation in this region right here, they put a grid with eight different colored tracers okay, that are going to be entrained by the rising plume. And we keep track of where they go and where they end up and where they might be sampled if you were to melt the mantle and extract that melt. So these red lines show the trajectories right, of those tracers. And they look kind of nice, right? They're more or less going smoothly up. What's pictured over here right, is how they end up at the surface. And we started with a nice regular grid but now they get all mixed up together and stretched and stirred around each other. And the complexity here arises because we're changing both density uh, and I guess viscosity varies as well. Okay. So up to now we've only been worrying, actually that was an example of a three-dimensional flow, the last two pictures. We've only thought about how to interpret mixing in two dimensions, right? Uh, 
And we found that to get good mixing requires time dependence or flows that are chaotic. So what happens now when we add a third spatial dimension, given that we live in a three-dimensional world? In a classic paper, V.I. Arnaud showed that, in fact, three-dimensional steady flows can be chaotic. So this, this is great, right? Three-dimensional flows, you're always going to get chaotic flow. It turns out in a convecting system that has a constant viscosity that the flows are not chaotic. But once you add plate motion, flows become chaotic once again. And I'll show you one example to illustrate this. To help understand what we'll be looking at, uh, we're going to take our flow field and think about it uh, by subdividing it into two different types of flows. And you've seen this twice already, right? Jessica talked about this. I think VED may have, if I can remember back a whole week. And uh, John Arnaud did this as well, right? You can take a flow field and subdivide it into what we call here poloidal flow and toroidal flow. What's the distinction? Uh, John talked about vorticity, right? Vorticity was the curl of the velocity. It's basically a measure of the rotation of the flow. And the, a poloidal flow is, is defined in a way so that there's no vorticity, no rotation, with the rotation axis directed outward from the surface of the Earth, outward in the radial direction. And the toroidal flow, in contrast, involves rotations in that horizontal plane, right? And so you characterize a rotation by a ro direction of a rotation axis. The toroidal flow is the part that has rotation axes directed out of the Earth. And things we see at the surface of the Earth that are consequences of these motions, things like ridges and trenches, right, involve no rotation. Uh, transform boundaries are associated with rotation. And on the Earth at the present time, of the energy associated with this motion, about equal amounts are in these different types of flows. Okay, so steady flows uh, should be, shouldn't produce chaotic mixing, but once you add plate motions, in fact, they do. So I'll only show you one example. Uh, what we're doing now is we're, we're looking at a box in which we have two plates with a transform boundary and two ridges. Plate in the upper left moves to the upper left. The one in the lower right moves to the lower right. We can embed uh, passive tracers and look at where they end up going. And just like those two-dimensional flows, in fact, you find that there are regions outlined here in red where things follow these beautiful periodic orbits. They do the same thing again and again and again. Right? The analogy here would be there is an elliptic point inside there. There are other regions, in fact, identified by these blue trajectories where things start exploring all the box. Right? They move all over the place. These are examples of chaotic streamlines. We can also look at a Poincaré section right, where we're basically mapping trajectories down into the midplane. And we can identify these islands where things don't mix, places where mixing is much more efficient. And the conclusion of this particular study is that uh, being able to produce uh, toroidal flow roughly doubles the efficiency of mixing inside a typical convecting system. Okay, so we began er at the beginning with this picture, right? We've talked about stretching and folding. We haven't talked about molecular diffusion, right? When does molecular diffusion happen and do we need to worry about it? The equation that describes molecular, molecular diffusion is called the diffusion equation. Right? In our moving reference frame, it says that the change in concentration with respect to time scales like the divergence of the flux of that concentration, which is governed by some kind of flux equation. Right? So let's do a little bit of scaling here. Right? The left-hand side scales like a composition difference divided by a time scale. Right-hand side is that composition difference times the, thermal, uh, times the chemical diffusivity divided by a length squared. Right, so this says that length scales over which diffusion have occurred scale like the square root of diffusivity times time. We can put in real numbers. Right? I've listed here some examples of diffusivities. In over 4 billion years, diffusion should happen over length scales of about a meter or so in the mantle. Okay, so this is a problem that Louise addressed some time ago. And so what she did is she looked... Yeah, I don't think I'm showing, I'm not showing many recent papers sort of on purpose, actually, because these are all idealized model problems. Again, the intention was for you to get a sense of how to think about how mixing happens, right? Okay, so the model problem is very much like the ones you've seen already, except it's just one dimensional. We have a slab here of something with concentration, of concentration one embedded in something that has concentration zero. We're going to apply an extensional flow or hyperbolic flow. How's the thickness of this uh, 
gray layer going to change in time? Things are either not happening or linear or it's exponential, right? But it's an extensional flow, so it should thin exponentially in time. Okay, okay so what Louis then keeps track of is the concentration as a function of position inside the gray layer and in the surroundings as, it dif as the, concentra com uh, the composition diffuses. And that's what's plotted in the right. Composition on the vertical axis versus position going from zero to one in the middle. Uh, for a chosen strain rate, we started with a thickness of three kilometers. Notice the horizontal scale, right? This is just a few centimeters. So after stretching for hundreds of millions of years, this filament gets very thin. And you can start seeing finally that the signature of diffusion. Things have been moving from the inside out. So I said earlier diffusion doesn't matter. And one way to think about why this is the case is illustrated in the left and I'll explain with scaling next. What's plotted on the vertical axis is the homogenization time scale, basically the time scale for the concentration to decrease by a factor of E as a function of the strain rate, right? So it's, uh, this is a log scale, this is a log scale. Each of these curves corresponds to different diffusivities. Those curves basically lie right on top of each other, right? So the reason the homogenization time scale decreases with strain rate is because it's uh, proportional to strain rate. And why doesn't diffusion matter, right? Essentially, we're stretching, length scales are decreasing exponentially with respect to time. Diffusion occurs, scales how with time? just like the square root. Square root of time is way, way slower than exponential. And so what ultimately gets you down to length scales where diffusion matters is the exponential stretching. Uh, I, I don't need to explain the thing on the right. This is quite handy and useful though. Can you think about why? Let's imagine you want to know what's the time scale to homogenize or mix things into the mantle or any convecting system. All that matters, right, is the average strain rate you experience in time, right? Diffusion doesn't matter, right? And because uh, stretching is exponential in time, roughly a good rule of thumb is sort of five to 10 overturns will give you enough convective stretching to uh, homogenize things reasonably well, right? So that's true for magmas, it's true for the mantle, right? Because in the end, stretching and ultimately mixing is controlled by decreasing length scales, and that happens much faster through stretching than it does through diffusion. Okay. Any questions before we go on to a different topic? Yeah. If you run one more time, I mean, more time, will the, the gap be filled with trajectories? Yes, okay, so everything outside these red things actually would be completely filled in blue. And maybe I haven't. In, in that case, I don't know. So I have. Yeah, so depending on, I think this geometry is slightly different. I'm sorry, it's, well, sh I don't know what happened. I think that's saying it's almost coffee time. Okay, I like the picture on the right, right? Because it's illustrating sort of the trajectories these particles are taking. And uh, so everything outside this torus here gives, uh, has uh, chaotic stretching and very good mixing. There are these subpaths, these little windy light colored ones along which things go. And then there's another torus here about which things go. So actually it's very complicated trajectories for this very simple geometry. Uh, I'm gonna get all my hidden slides showing up and you don't want that. Let's see if that works. Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah, of so, course. Um, is there a diffus diffusivity at which point the diffusion time scale becomes important? Like, obviously for these sort of very low diffusivities, it doesn't really matter, and we're all talking about convection, but for example, if you had something that was very rapid, sort of the diffusion of hydrogen, for example, particularly if you were talking about melts, for example, 
would that become dominant over the convective time scale, or are we, or not dominant, or like equally as important? So, the reason diffusion in the mantle is unlikely to be important at the mantle scale is simply because length scales are really big, and the time scale for diffusion to happen over those length scales is very long. As you get to smaller and smaller systems, at some point diffusion does matter. And in fact, in the, the little movie by G.I. Taylor, he made the little point that as he came back to where he started, you could see the signature of diffusion. But that was a little tiny region. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to... Uh, and I'll skip a bunch of things, but there are, what we like to do, we've talked so far about the kinematics of mixing, how mixing happens, how properties of flow give rise to mixing. Of course, one of our objectives is to interpret measurements, right, and relate them to dynamics by the things we've just been talking about. So there are a variety of ways we can go about measuring mixing and characterizing mixing. We can run computer simulations, right, and keep track of where things go. And I'm going to skip showing you some, but you did this actually in your... Uh, aspect tutorial, right? When it comes to characterizing mixing, right, we have to start measuring something. And Julio Tino, who wrote a book on this topic, made the very important and good point that maybe is a little bit subtle, that it's important to distinguish between how you go about measuring mixing or characterizing it and the processes that produce mixing, right? The processes that produce mixing are a flow. What you measure is uh, where the products of that flow. So ideally, you, pick, you have to, of course, in practice, pick some measure of mixing based on what it is you're able to measure and what you're trying to learn. But ideally, you pick something, you pick a measurement technique or a measure that allows you to relate it to the flow that you might be trying to understand. So a variety of approaches can be used. We've talked about this thing called the mixing efficiency E. Right, remember, mixing stretching basically scales exponentially with respect to time. So another thing that people sometimes use is the constant of proportionality in that exponential stretching time. Uh, other things you could do is you could, uh, if you have a spatial set of measurements or a time series of measurements, you can use spectral analysis and look for characteristic wavelengths or structures. And people do this a lot. Easiest thing to do for if you, you're mixing, say, that red uh, fluid into the green fluid is just measure how thick the filaments of red fluid are and look at the size distribution of those red filaments. And the good thing about any of these measures is, is that the flows that we've been talking about all make predictions for what those measures should look like. And so you can compare your measurements with what the model predictions are and in principle use this to distinguish between mixing processes or even test hypotheses. And this is what I intended to show you next and I'm not going to because I want to make sure we leave time for questions at the end. But a reminder going back to something we said earlier, is that when we now look at measurements of something, we have to think about how those measurements were acquired. Okay. And in particular, we may be sampling structure at some spatial scale, and the structures may exist at both larger scales and smaller scales. So here's a very simple illustration. We have a box. Right? We heat it from the bottom, cool it from the top, so it's convecting. We'll let half the box be white, half the box is black. Okay. And we're going to sample the color inside a little subsampling region at different points in time. And what we're going to do is systematically change the size of the sampling volume. Okay. So it's kind of a busy plot. What are we looking at? Uh, the vertical axis, we have three different uh, cases. Right? So horizontal axis represents different snapshots in time. This number says is a measure of how many overturns have happened in this convecting system. And each column corresponds to changing systematically the size of the sampling volume. On the left, it's big. On the right, it's really small. Okay. So initially, right, in our sampling volume, we're either going to measure either black uh, or white, I guess, is uh, zero, or all black, which is one. So the, what you're looking at here are histograms of concentration. And after a certain amount of stirring, if your box, sampling box is big, you're sort of going to see gray, right? You're, you're going to see some white and some black and the median of white and black is gray, right, in the mid, some number in the middle. If your sampling volume is small, however, right, you can preserve the ability to sample both white and black ever longer because you're looking at smaller scale structures. And I have no idea why this is not symmetric. <laughs> okay. But I think you get the point, right? If your sampling volume will homogenize something over some scale, and your that homogenization volume through the sampling could be much bigger than some of the structures that you're interested in. <laughs> 
Just a reminder, to getting close to the end, that we've been talking about flow as a process for causing mixing and stirring. But of course, convection in the real Earth is also a source of heterogeneity because every time we have melting, right, we have partitioning and we change composition. And, and the reason we have melting is, of course, because we have convection, right? So we have melting at the surface of the Earth. This happens in multiple stages when we have subduction, both the fluids that might be released, the melting that happens, and the big mess of stuff that happens in the crust. Maybe mel melting happens in the middle of the Earth or at the base of the mantle. And again, associated with convection, if there are reactions between the mantle and the core, they will be stirred in as well. I guess the main point is just to remind you that even though we've been thinking about convection as a process of homogenization and stirring, it also produces heterogeneity as well. Okay. So I want to bring up two last topics to end on the general topic of mixing because there are two other systems or processes that produce mixing and earth science problems that are very important. So we, everything up to now, we've said the Reynolds number is very small, uh, small. Flow is governed by Stokes equations. In the core, the oceans and atmospheres, the Reynolds number is large. Those inertial terms, u dot grad u, matter, and the flow becomes turbulent. Uh, what does turbulence mean? Well, the flow becomes now a complicated function of both space and time. In particular, motions at very large scales transfer some of that energy to motions at ever smaller scales and it does this repeatedly and progressively. So this is a great way to cause mixing, right? You have something at one scale and you transfer it to smaller scales. Uh, and so what, what's illustrated here is an example of the generation of turbulence. Uh, the f we've got two fluids, red and blue. The one on the top in red is moving to the right relative to the one at the bottom. And because of the differential motion across this boundary, small little fluctuations get amplified and give rise to this complicated pattern, which is a turbulent flow. So the point is turbulent flows are very effective at mixing compared to the laminar flows that we've been talking about. Another setting that in fact is relevant for thinking about, in fact, even products from the mantle is that in porous materials, mixing is very efficient, not because of molecular processes, but because of me uh, mechanical processes or the fluid flow itself. And this is terribly washed out, so you have to use a lot of creativity and, and imagination but it matters for the point I'm trying to make. So this is a porous material. Pretend there's solid grains in here with empty space around them. And the fluid is flowing through that empty space. So some of the pathways through that porous material might be long, others are short. We may have a single tube, and at the boundary of the tube, the flow is slow. In the middle of the tube, the velocity is much higher. Okay, what is it, what is it that causes stretching again? What aspect of a flow field? Gradients of velocity, differences in velocity, right? So at the scale of a single pore inside a porous material, we have differences in velocity. And actually the same GI Taylor showed for this case where we have a single pore, what looks like a diffusivity, it's called a dispersion, scales like the velocity squared, right? And for these other cases where you have complicated pathways in the porous material, typically what looks like a diffusivity, chemical diffusivity, will scale like a velocity. So the faster things flow, in fact, the faster mixing will occur. And in any porous material, this kind of what's called, um, uh, what do I call it here? Mechanical dispersion is always much greater than molecular diffusion. So to summarize, we've been focusing again mostly on what happens at small Reynolds numbers, but over a pretty big range of length scales. Actually, length scales are so big, we don't need to worry so much about diffusion. There's so many branches of science, of course, that care about mixing. And Louise Kellogg gave me this slide, right? And they're just summarized here. The thing to note is that they span a huge range of Reynolds numbers. And in these different limits, of course, mixing does operate differently. And a big range of length scales. Uh, nevertheless, actually, the point is that those building blocks I tried to illustrate, right? The rotation, the stretching, they are still the fundamental processes that give rise to mixing in all these different situations. So main point, again, I gave you a list of four points I want you to appreciate, right? Flow type matters. Time dependence enhances mixing. Three-dimensional flows are better at mixing. Even though flows may mix well, often there'll be regions that do not mix well. The properties of whatever you're stirring into the fluid matter, right, are active heterogeneities. Uh, I didn't have time to take you through examples of how we actually measure characteristics of things that have been stirred. Right? But because things are complicated as a function of space and time, 
and there's uncertainty in those properties and how they evolved, looking at statistical properties of things that are being mixed uh, turns out to be a, often a useful way of distinguishing between hypotheses rather than just, say, watching the movies like we did that I showed you earlier. Uh, thanks for showing up so early in the morning. Yes. You mentioned the, you mentioned the idea that after five overturns, the mantles, your system, would essentially be homogenized. And I'm, I'd like to apply this to something like subducted oceanic crust, which is maybe five or ten kilometers thick. Um, the diffusivity of the major elements in the oceanic crust is going to be pretty slow. I'm wondering, so it's the, really the stretching that's going to cause the homogenization, but I think you don't end up with total homogenization, you end up with extremely thin filaments. Yes. Okay, so the question is really, right, the key though is still that we, we're, we are producing exponential stretching with respect to time. So after 5, 10, 20 uh, overturns, you've stretched things to the point that there's centimeter uh, scale features, at which point diffusion then does finally matter. And I guess that was what was captured in those figures from Louise Kellogg, right? that eventually you get to length scales of just a few centimeters, at which point diffusion will start to matter. And so actually in a magma chamber, because diff diffusivity is higher, you may need a smaller number of overturns to get length scales that are small. Just do we see like the sort of elliptical points you were showing in those sort of box simulations in like a full three-dimensional uh, spherical model? Like, do you see points where you don't get any stretching? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, do we get those elliptical points about which things rotate and always come back in three-dimensional flows? You get them in all flows. Yeah. And I guess I, I could probably dig up a picture that kind of illustrates it, where you take the per current, current day mantle flow and you can keep track of which areas don't mix and which areas do. Um, yeah. This is to follow up Matt's question. So um, subducted oceanic crust, um, the way Alan showed it in his talk, if some of it is segregated in that LLSVP, will that survive the mantle overturns and hence preserve its shape rather, rather than getting stretched and stirred and homogenized eventually? Okay, this is a really complicated question that uh, we were talking <laughs> about even before, earlier this morning, right? Okay, so we have a mantle, we've got stuff at the top, a thin layer at the bottom, and they're both convecting, and we'd like to know how much you can entrain of one fluid into the other one. And the entrainment of one fluid by another turns out to be a complicated problem. You've got to match uh, stresses. And quite a bit of work has been done on what that, entra what that entrainment rate should be and what the length scale should be. So there's scaling relationships for it. I mean, ideally, numerical simulations will resolve it as well. The challenge is that... Uh, Uh, there's a resolution, of course, at which we're resolving things numerically. And for those of you who, who worry about these little things, you will see that there are artifacts, of course, in entrainment in these simulations due to the finite spatial resolution. So the, in a numerical simulation, you keep track of things like entrainment, for example, by putting in tracers and keeping track of where those tracers are and assigning attributes to those tracers and the fluid where those tracers are. And once you get down to length scales that are as small as or s smaller than a few of, of the grid size, that, grid size that you use for your simulation, it's difficult to resolve what's happening. And entrainment may be happening on length scales of uh, kilometers, for example. So there is value in the uh, theoretical models for how entrainment happens. And there are a variety of different scaling relationships. So I haven't answered your question at all. I've just said that we do understand how entrainment happens. And if you know densities and viscosities, you can make estimates of what that entrainment rate should be. Brent had his hand up for a while, then Kanani. So when, the, when you have melt at ridges, is that enough to change the importance of the role of diffusion? And would it limit the scales at which we could observe heterogeneity in the mantle anyways? 
I would, in terms of interpreting something that comes out of a mid-ocean ridge system, right? The reason I showed you that what happens in a porous material is that when fluids move through a porous material, it's following convoluted pathways. Mixing is super efficient and fast, and so the transport in the porous in the through porous flow or through a network of fractures or dikes will be very effective at causing mixing, mechanical mixing. Kanani and then uh, Uli. So I'm I'm thinking of this unmixing that you know that was shown by the the Taylor videos, and um, yeah. So, can I imagine, like, uh, so, like, if we have a Pangaea or a supercontinent, so forth, and so where um, the subduction has stopped when the continents have met each other, um, and then, you know, the spreading out, like, you'd imagine that these, I mean, right now you've got, in, just in this video, you have two um, subducting areas, right? And they're, and they're stirring in the opposite directions. But, I mean, could, could, could there be a little bit of unstirring um, when you have, you know, new ridges and, there, and therefore new subducting parts? Like, yeah. so like could we, we get a little yeah. bit of unstirring? And That's a good question. <laughs> Should there be unstirring? You know, in an ideal system, right, if you just had two plates going back and forth, back and forth, nothing else happening, I think that should be reversible. But the feature of these chaotic flows is because things are chaotic, right, you don't get to unstir. Things get close together, they move far apart exp exponentially with respect to time, and they're not going to go back to where they came from. And those, the pr production of those points that cause that are produced by the time dependence, for example. So the G.I. Taylor one is special, right, in that you, did ex you reversed the flow exactly, and so you have to go exactly back to where you started. But we break that reversibility in these problems by introducing time dependence. And so, in fact, the nonlinearity, in a way, is un entering through the boundary conditions. So the real mantle definitely wouldn't be reversible. And I don't even think it would show traces of that reversibility because there are other things going on with respect to time. Uli? So, again, following up from Matt's question, and you pointed out the importance of sampling, right? So it, we can sample, certainly, the Earth's not necessarily after a sufficient number of overturns so that we have perfect mixing. And what I'm thinking about is peroxinite veins in, in ophiolites, for example. I mean, can they really be then, you know, subducted oceanic crust that has had only two or three over overturns, has been stretched but not perfectly mixed? And also, you know, if you think about um, depleted oceanic lithosphere, that isn't very different than the surrounding mantle. It doesn't have a huge density difference. I mean, can that reappear again at mid-ocean ridges? So I skipped over the slides of time. I was going to take you through examples of how you can measure measurements. That's what I was thinking. This was, I thought, a beautiful paper. I leave the question mark in there for maybe a reason I'll mention later, right? So Allegra and Turcotte went to uh, some of these peridotites, and they measured the thickness of peroxinite veins in the surrounding layers of light and measured the, the, the relationship between the number they see and their size. So remember, mixing happens exponentially. So let's imagine you take the crust, as Uli said, you put in the mantle. It starts off, say, five kilometers thick, and it's stretching with respect to time and getting progressively thinner. Now you randomly sample that. You're going to see more thin stuff than thicker stuff. So what this is, in fact, exactly what they found. On the vertical axis is the number of layers with thickness bigger than some amount. So they see a small number of layers bigger than a meter and a much greater number, for example, bigger than 10 centimeters. And so one interpretation of this is you produce something with some initial size, and you've simply stretched it out, and you're randomly sampling it. I'll leave the question mark here because, of course, there are other ways to make these peroxinite veins through other processes. Although all those processes should be able to say something about the size distribution. So, right. No, not at all. No, there's no reason also, right? I mean, the real Earth, it's not like we put stuff in and then we, we wait 20 overturn times and we say, okay, it's going to be ho homogeneous. We're continually producing heterogeneity. We're continually sampling heterogeneity. And so this is, in fact, why you should expect to see a distribution like this, right? That you're continually adding large length scales that are continually being stretched to smaller length scales. Yeah. Ben? Given the um, 
the efficiency of mixing in, in porous media. because it's coffee break time coming okay. up. Okay, all right, sorry, I'll be quick. Given the efficiency of mixing in porous media, yeah. Ed, do you have any ideas for how you can preserve some of the, the heterogeneity introduced during melting at mid-ocean ridges? Still at the surface, like the. So I will say radon. just a few things. The real geochemist here will say something way more insightful, right? But the example I picked for you, we just I, we imagine just passive tracers moving through a very complicated pore space, right? With large spatial variations in velocity introduced by the topology of that pore space. But melt and the surrounding rocks are reactive, right? They can react with each other. Things are freezing. Things are reacting. And so in that transport process, you're continually having chemical reactions happen that will give rise to chemical heterogeneity. So the real Earth isn't just a, we're not just advecting something passively. It's a reactive transport system. Hugo, you had your hand up. I have a more theoretical question. Uh, the number of stagnation points, the elliptic and hyperbolic points, are governed for the topology of the, of the disk in this case. Right. Then there are similar results for the sphere in the case of the, of the Earth uh, that says how uh, these, these stagnation points and steady surfaces are uh, working, moving. Yeah, so given that, right, the question is, you know, on a three-dimensional Earth, what governs the number and location of these uh, periodic points, right, where you get stretching or maybe rotation? And what's an example physically of one of these places where you get exponential stretching? Where a plume forms, right? If you want, you can go back to your, um, uh, the simulation we ran in our tutorial. Ouch. Well, right. And I've left the tracers in here, and you can watch two start very close here, and watch what happens to their relative separation. Right? They're moving apart from each other exponentially with respect to time. And then in the middle of this flow, what are they doing? Not very much, right? We have an elliptic point. We have a hyperbolic point. So actually, if, if you want to think about what it is in the Earth that's doing this, every place you have a subduction zone, every place you have a plume, those are the places where you're doing much of the stretching. Underneath plates, right, you're not doing very much at all. Uh, Adam hasn't asked a question yet. But <coughs> no. Uh, but uh, in studying seismic heterogeneity, and we are talking about large scales, but at these scales, we see that there is a redness in the spectrum, that at the low wave numbers, you essentially have similar amount of uh, energy, but then you come to a shoulder which sort of drop, drops like uh, well, uh, squared one wave number, I guess. So is, is that some indication of the type of mixing that we have? So I guess what Adam is asking is, is there insight into the nature of mixing from the spectrum of heterogeneity that we see? And so seismologists do this all the time, right? Geochemists do this too. The earliest paper I'm aware of and, uh, who, that tried to do this was Mike Gurness in 1986. He looked at the spectrum of uh, heterogeneity along mid-ocean ridges, but Bill will correct me if I'm wrong. And this is a paper that came out just a month ago looking at the spectrum of heterogeneity in helium isotopes in the upper right, where you can identify, and the point is you can identify characteristic length scales. and Interesting in this paper, and I'm not a geochemist, so I really struggled to understand this paper, everything they were saying, because all their figures are for helium isotopes, but their interpretations draw on interpreting all those other, other isotopes, right, from that menagerie of uh, species that Bill White told us about. But they see a long length scale, right, 1,000 kilometers, 500. Where they have better spatial sampling, they see smaller length scales. And they try and connect up. And you can see, right, there's systematic covariations of helium isotope ratios with bathymetry. This is controlled by temperature, right? And so they're trying to relate structures you see in temperature to those you see geochemically. 
and they noted that the scales they see here and their spatial location seems to be correlated with these long fingers of red anomalies that scott french published in science i guess last year so there is an argument made in this paper that there is a connection between those large scale structures seen in the mantle and things that you might see geochemically and that's what I got out of this paper. I think the geochemists will undoubtedly have opinions about it and their interpretation. Okay. So in honor of uh, mixing, right, we'll go re eat something. Mm -hmm.